every morning you wake up, the enemy conspires to steal your joy. From the, the baby crying that woke you up or the dog that barked to that stiff back as you are now experiencing, Greg. I am. Or the stiff neck. My wife has make, been making fun of me that I'm moving like C-3PO. <laughs> to, to the stubbed toe on the way to the bathroom. To the, the, the scrolling of social media and the immediate comparison game and envy that's happening in your heart. To the, the scale that tells you the bad news. To the, to the scrolling of, of news that, that brings anxiousness and, and frustration into your heart. The enemy conspires to steal your joy. Just this morning on the way into church, Greg's joy was attempted to be stolen. I don't know. I don't know how you're doing, Greg. With... <laughs> with we have it, was, a, it was a moment. <laughs> we have a fantasy league here at church, and Greg lost last week. Can we, can we praise God for that? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and, and uh, his opponent who, who beat him brought a large sign. A billboard. A billboard with the results. It actually was a great joy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole thing's about laughing. It really was. I, I, it was a joy of friendship and a moment, like, of humbling of losing. I'm going to take you down today, though. <laughs> I get you today. <laughs> to, to opening up those windows and, and you look at your neighbor's car, the car that you want in your driveway, to driving to work or to church this morning and getting cut off in traffic by an idiot. <laughs> the enemy conspires to steal our joy. Moment by moment. Now, why does the enemy even care about our joy? Because joy is intrinsically connected to, entwined with worship. <laughs> and if, if the enemy can steal our joy, he can steal our worship. Our worship. You see, God is not a joy stealer. The enemy is a joy stealer. God is a joy fulfiller. God, the true God, is a God who brings joy and wants the joy to bubble up in us that we would be fulfilled in the overflow of his joy. God is a joy giver. In fact, in the midst of this world with all of its brokenness and all of its darkness, God gives gifts, rays of his glory for us to open. And we, we get to open those gifts and give thanks to him and worship him. And, and Solomon is going to take us to a place to say, that's, that's one of the best things. That's one of the most foundational things we have in this world. Consider these words out of chapter 5. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Some of us think, the world is broken. The world has darkness. But in the midst of that darkness, in the midst of that brokenness, God sends these rays of glory. And one of the chief things we can do is open those gifts and worship him. So one of the joys of our life you'll hear about, I could put pictures up on the screen if we want. Mm -hmm. Two grandkids. We have two grandkids. They're five and six right now. We see them as often as we can. They live in Colorado. So it's, I don't know. We try to go like every other month, even if it's just for a day to see the grandkids. I will say this. Every time we see them, we load them up with surprises 
Deborah, Deborah wraps e- each one. And the surprises can be just a, a blank coloring sheet that we're going to sit down and color together. It could be some kind of gift. It could be a new pillow, whatever it is. Just surprises. And the kids go wild for these surprises. And they're, the joy on their faces, it is a good thing. And then we get to sit with them and play with what, whatever that surprise is. It's God. God is giving us surprises constantly. Rays of his glory in the, in the feeling of the warm sun shining on our face, in the, in the refreshment of a cool glass of water or, or the dip in a cold pool after a hot day, in the, in the soul-stirring rhythms of a song, in the beauty of of culture and art. God is giving us gifts for us to worship him. One of the kind of foundational passages of worship is, is this out of Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the person or the, the man who takes refuge in him. God wants us to taste and see him. That's, that's what worship is. When we, when we are super hot and we take a cold glass of water, we go, ah. That ah is worship. God, God is designed to reveal himself to us so that every single day we go, ah, oh, his mercy, his grace. We, we go to some great restaurant, we're telling everybody about that restaurant. To taste and see the goodness of God, this is worship. Now, there's, there's lots of ways Satan would like to get us distracted. He would like us to worship not God but ourselves, to think we deserve it, to think we've earned it, to look at the gifts of life and measure them up and think that maybe even we fall short because, well, they got more than we did. Satan would like us to worship the objects themselves, that it's just stuff that's going to, to bring us pleasure, and so we begin to worship the stuff and ourselves. That's not the design. God wants us to worship him. And Solomon, in the midst of this unique letter, we're walking through this series on Ecclesiastes, he's talking about the brokenness of the world, the vapor of the world. He's going to say, in the midst of that brokenness, God has gifts, and the best we can do in this world is to open up those gifts, receive them, and thank God. Now, if you've been with us through this series, it might feel like, well, where did this come from? Like, I mean, this has been pretty dark, pretty raw. But, but that's the whole point. Solomon, Solomon wants to strip away all the illusions of this under-the-sun world, the, the, the world disconnected from God in terms of what we can just see. And he wants to say, listen... That world in and of itself, on its own, is a bleak place. But the rays of God's glory that pierce through the darkness, and I want you to see them. And if you don't, if you don't have the capacity to respond in joy, be careful. Be wary of where your heart is. Listen to the warning that he turns and offers us at the beginning of chapter 6. There's an evil that I have seen under the sun in this this world that we live in, disconnected from God. And it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing of all he desires. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. There's that word Hevel. This is vapor. It is a grievous evil. It's a grievous evil. It's not, not a small thing when we're not able to step into the joy that God is offering us. Now let's just pause and ask this question. What are some of the things that can steal our joy? What are some of the things that prevent us from experiencing God's joy? Well, let's begin here. Pride. Pride. When, when God offers me joy and I receive it with an attitude of, well, yeah, I deserve that, 
joys sucked out. A, a, a raise is offered, and no joy is received because you're like, well, I deserve that. And so it can be in life. We can go around receiving the gifts of God's joy, but our, our arrogance, our pride has us in this, well, I deserve it mode. And so pride can keep us from God's joy. Very different thing can challenge God's joy. Shame. Shame. Now, how can shame challenge God's joy in our life? Well, shame can challenge God's joy in the exact opposite way. We can... We cannot actually receive the gift because we don't think, I, I can't possibly take that. I can't possibly deserve it. You, you ever met somebody who can't receive a compliment, right? There's this like resistance. This is, this is the life of a person who has embedded shame in their life that pushes back, that can't receive the joy that God has for them. We have two sets of parents, mine and angels, who are just so generous in so many ways. And one of the ways that they're generous is through vacations. And so there have been multiple vacations I've been on that I've like had to check my heart because I'm struggling to receive the gift that I know I, I didn't pay for. I don't deserve. Shame. How about envy and comparison can steal joy? You, you, receive, you receive the gift of that new phone, but it's not the latest phone. You receive the, the gift of a, of, a, of a delicious meal, and then you look over at, at the person across the restaurant who received a better meal. Envy, comparison can steal our joy. We have to be careful about the, the joy stealers in life. Solomon goes on. He continues and paints a picture of someone unable to receive joy. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Do you hear the fundamental biblical worldview of, of the goodness of life? The goodness of of those who are the very youngest to those who are the very oldest, from womb to tomb, all life, God's gift. And, and Solomon's like, if you can't appreciate that gift, it's better off for you to just die alone in the desert, for you to have never been born. It's a stark statement. How? How can we be those who open our hearts to receive God's joy? It begins with God himself. God not only gives joy, he is the one who gives us the capacity to enjoy joy. Listen to, I want to flip back a little bit earlier in, in verse 2. Yet God does not give him the power to enjoy them. We have to be those on our knees praying, God, give me the eyes to see. Give me the ears to hear. God, this morning, help me to step into this day and receive the joy. I want to taste. I want to see. And I know that that's a gift only you can give. Like modern plumbing, a refrigerator. The, the list would be really long just to of the simple things to thank God for. You can have eyes to see it or you can totally miss it. Our, our kids, when they were little, we went to SeaWorld an awful lot. They used to have these year passes for like 50 bucks. So we, would, we went to SeaWorld a lot. Each one of our kids got to be like the, the, the person up front petting Shamu or petting the dolphins. But every time you're there, you see some family that gets wet when, when Shamu throws his tail feather up, or tail feather, his <laughs> tail up, and, 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 and pushes water outside of the thing. They warn you, and they warn you, and they warn you. They sing songs, you know, uh, if you're sitting in the first 10 rows, there's something you ought to know. There's a 50-50 bet. You'll get 100% wet. And then, like, the, the front benches are all painted blue. They warn you. And then... Then you see some family up there. Shamu comes over, throws his, his, his tail fin up. The water comes over, and the dad is like, oh, it's ruining my camera. Do you think, like, buddy, you're on vacation. 
A killer whale, 20 feet from you, just showered you with water on an 80 degree day. Like, like do, do you get the silliness of somehow complaining in this moment? Soak up the glory of your family, of your children, of the joy of being here, of creation. Like, take it in. But sometimes we don't have eyes to see. This is not a small teaching in Ecclesiastes. This is in chapter 2. It's in chapter 3. It's in chapter 5. It's in chapter 7. And it's repeated again in chapter 8. We're not going to read through all of them, but I'm going to back up into chapter 2 and read these words, similar words again, chapter 2, beginning in verse 24. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? It, it all comes from God. He's saying that there are so many don't miss it moments all around us where God, God does some miracle, where God whispers in our soul, the king of the universe nudges the circumstance to do a little miracle and let us know he's right there with us. He whispers in our thoughts and in our feelings. The king of glory. The psalm is saying, in the midst of a broken world, yeah, there's darkness here. There is brokenness here. Like the, the, the best we have is to not miss all of the gifts. There's rays of glory all around us, and we ought to see them and receive them and open them and climb into his lap and give him thanks. This, this is the pattern of God, that we not miss it. Martin Luther, in commenting on this, uh, on this out of Ecclesiastes, this, this is the principal conclusion like this. This is the point of the whole book. We ought to be teaching our children gratitude. We ought to be infusing every single day with thanksgiving towards God, noticing all the little things. Look, I, I don't know what your list is. Ice cream bars. I have lots of food on my list. <laughs> frozen grapes. You ever sit outside in a hot Arizona day and take frozen grapes and just pop them in? I think Solomon in all his splendor at the pinnacle of Israel he didn't have frozen grapes to pull out of the freezer. We've been given so much. And it's good. And Solomon says, remember this. Remember this. It's why, it's why in our mission statement, you hear every single week, we exist to cultivate a community that enjoys God and transforms the world through the gospel. We, we, we could have said, and worships God or and glorifies God. Why, why enjoys God? Because enjoying God is worshiping him. In fact, if you're not enjoying God, it's not worship. If you, if you pray, read scripture, if you come to church because it is a duty, you have to, it's not worship. God wants us to taste and see his goodness, to worship him. And Solomon says, at the foundation, this is hugely important. In a broken world, receive the gifts of God, pay attention to him, and live with gratitude to him for all he does. Hmm. I mean, if Greg as a Vikings fan can experience joy, you can experience joy. This is... Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have to do this. So there was... You know how many jokes fly through your head and you don't say them? So earlier in the sermon, just because he's, 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 he's forcing the issue. Earlier in the sermon, when he was talking about stubbing your toe, you guys heard that? Like if you stub your toe, everything goes bad in the morning. And then he said specifically, if you drive on your way to church and some, someone stupid cuts you off. Did you hear that? Let it be known that this morning, the driver who was rolling through a stop sign on his way to cut me off was John <laughs> Michael Beeson. All right, we're there. Okay, right? <laughs> it's because I saw him. I stopped myself from doing it, but I so wanted to cut him off just to, just to, just to test him. 
<laughs> oh, man, where are we? I don't even know. Uh, yeah. here's, here, here's the glory in this. God has made us for joy. He's made every single one of us for joy. Actually, he, he's implanted. It, it's, it's part of being an image bearer of the Almighty God. He's, he's placed in our heart this place for joy. Listen, listen to it. I'm going to flip forward to chapter 3. I'm going to listen to Solomon continue. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. God has given us this sense of wonder, of awe, of longing for something more than this this under-the-sun world. Then the the nine-to-five world, and the just just clocking in your time, even in the midst of that toil, there's something in all of us, a yearning, a longing for something deep and profound, not the ephemeral happiness of this world, but a deep and profound joy. I'm reading this book by this atheist social psychologist. It's a great book called The Anxious Generation. Just I'm just going to plug it. Like parents, every parent ought to read this book, all right? So aside, he's an atheist. And the last chapter of his book on the, is on the God-shaped hole. And he talks about how in his own heart, he has a yearning, a longing for something more. There it is. God has put eternity in your heart. He has made you to long for joy. So I'm a, I'm a big time nerd Tolkien fan, love Lord of the Rings. I know I'm like, I'm losing a lot of you here, but just stick with me, just stick with me, all right? In in the Lord of the Rings, everyone, everyone is tempted by the power, the alluring power of the ring at some point in the narrative, except one person, Tom Bombadil. Now, if you don't know that name, it's because Peter Jackson includes like everything except Tom Bombadil in his remake of the story. It's because this like, what do you do with this guy? In the, in the darkness, in the oppression, in the, in the pull for pride and yearning and envy, there, there's, this, there's this dude who's this joyful guy living in the, the forest and just appreciating life. And it's just kind of this ah moment in the narrative where the, where the troop, as they're headed toward Mount Mordor, comes across Tom Bombadil, and he, he gives them honeycomb and cream and freshly break bread. And he's just, he's just this, this figure who's full of joy. And he, he at one point has, he, he takes hold of the ring, but, but there's no temptation for him because there's nothing he wants more. His heart is filled up with the joy of his maker. This is how God has created us to be that we would be so filled with the joy of the Lord that the things of this earth would grow strangely dim, strangely unimportant as we experience the gifts of his joy for us. Now, it may be, depending on your church experience in life, that you hear this and it sounds strange, almost unchristian, because There are traditions in Christianity in which if you have a big smile on your face, it must be because you're sinning. (laughs) The church I became a Christian in had wood bench pews, no cushions, because cushions would be sinful. No decorations, it was all just natural wood because, because decorations, art, culture in that way, that, that takes us too far into the world. You had to sit uncomfortably on a chair that's designed to be uncomfortable. But that's really not truth. In truth, Christians ought to have the most joyful, celebrative gatherings and parties of anyone on earth. They ought to be a people who receive the gifts of God and overflow with thanksgiving to him over and over and over. 
It's a, it's a big deal. So the passage John went to in chapter three, I'm gonna continue the very next verse. You'll recognize the tone of it. I perceived that there is nothing better for them. That's people living in this broken world. I perceive that there's nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. In arts and in culture and in friendship and in beauty and in food and in sex and in music and in work and sports and in creation, God has given us gifts all around us. And we have to be people who pay attention to those gifts, who recognize them, who receive them, who celebrate them. Ray Steadman talks about this, uh, 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 of people who get caught up simply in the objects or themselves. Says, Isn't it strange that the more you run after life, panting after every pleasure, meaning worshiping just the objects, the less you find. That it's just a vapor. If you worship self, all the pleasure of the world is just going to be a vapor. It's never going to be really satisfying. If you worship objects, everything's just going to be a vapor. It's just going to be meaningless because it's never really going to satisfy. If we worship God and receive his gifts as we climb into his lap and give thanks, it's worship. Because, but the more you take Life is a gift from God's hand. Responding in thankful gratitude for the delight of the moment, the more that seems to come to you. God is not a joy killer. He's not a joy stealer. This is nothing against librarians in the room. There are times, there are times I have heard of God portrayed like an angry, cranky librarian. Just shh. So if having fun is against the rules. No. God is a joyful gift giver. In fact, the supreme, the supreme act of glory in the history of the universe is God giving us his son. Mm. A gift. A gift. And some people totally miss that because they're not they're not looking to the gifts of God. They're simply worshiping self, their own ideas, their own objects. God is giving us gifts, Jesus Christ being the most supreme of them. Receive, receive him, receive his gifts, and live a life of gratitude today. Psalmist says, this, this is as good as it gets in this broken world. Receive his gifts and praise him. Hmm. So last weekend, we had the joy of going out to California, our family, and celebrating our daughter's 21st birthday. Camille, if you've been here for a while, you might know Camille, because she she's, she's on the worship team. And Camille's just, she's a light. She's everywhere she goes. She's a dancer. She's, she's just filled with joy. And so as, as we were there uh, celebrating her birthday, and she also had a, a theater performance, and so we're, we're out at lunch giving her gifts, and she's opening every card and tearing up with every card, and then squealing with delight of a, of a little girl opening every present. And my son, Soren, uh, looks over, and he's like, Camille, you're the best person to give gifts to. <laughs> you're the best. And it's true. This is, this is worship. This is how, how God longs for us to live our days with the with the enthusiasm and joy that he has made for us. When he calls us to a childlike faith, I think this is part of it. I've come that you may have life abundant, Jesus said. I want you to experience me. Step into my joy. So what do we do? What do we do with this? Let's close with two simple, practical applications. Number one, kill the joy stealers. Kill the joy stealers. Kill, kill those things that, that come, come at you and, and steal your joy. Think of the, the ways that Greg has already framed this, that, that we're, we're drawn to worship ourselves. Kill, ask God to kill, kill your own ego, to give you humility, 
For God to kill in you the, the envy, the longing for the stuff in this world is an ultimate end. You, just think about the way that our world is made. 21st century America is built to steal your joy. It pretends otherwise. But social media, a massive joy stealer. It's been proven. It's a mental health destroyer. Why? Because out there is the, the highlight reels of other people's lives. Like you get a, you've get, gotten a glimpse of this, right? Like you, you have the good friends who are married and like they're going through a really hard time. But then on social media, it's his birthday. And you think, you think wow, she, he's an amazing. I don't know. You're, steal your joy. You're in, you're in Rocky Point enjoying a beach vacation. And then there on social media, there's your friend in Hawaii. All of a sudden, Rocky Point doesn't feel as great. Joy, steal the news. Like, every, I, can I just confess? Like, I, I, I have this within me to just be drawn, especially every four years. You're just pulled in. It's not enough to, like, watch the debate. I want to hear people talk about the debate and then talk about those who are talking about the debate. And all of a sudden, you're just, does that increase my joy? Is, it, is anyone's joy increased this week as you, you watch? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Like, a joy stealer. And so I have to like create these bumpers in my life. I do my time with the Lord in prayer and, and in the word in the morning. And then I have a 30 minute news podcast I listen to. And I try to, I try to shut down after that. Amazon. Talk about a joy stealer. <laughs> right? This will make you happy. And it will be delivered tomorrow by noon. <laughs> No. Oh, if only I had joy stealers, all of them. And we have to be on guard. We have to be killing the joy stealers. We have to be, be asking God to take away the, the fleshiness of our flesh, the sinfulness of our sin, to grant us a new heart, new eyes, to transform us who are, the, who are shameful, proud, envious people into those who are humble, loving, and compassionate, and joyful. It's important to dwell on that a bit. Because in some ways, you could summarize this message as go pursue happiness. Go pursue joy. Go pursue pleasure. Now, if we do that worshiping ourselves, we'll miss the whole point. It'll be meaningless. If we do that worshiping objects and stuff will miss the whole point and it will be meaningless. The only way this really makes sense is if we receive gifts from God, recognizing his goodness and give thanks to him. So the principal takeaway number one is kill the joy stealers. Number two, Find the rays of God's glory all around us. Open his gifts. Yes, Camille's a great person to give gifts to because, she's, because she dances with the gifts. If, if my grandkids looked back at me as you gave a gift and poo-pooed, oh, that's not good enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, you're not getting a lot more gifts. There's something about receiving that is a part of the giving. Well, God is the greatest gift giver in all history. Mm -hmm. And this morning, while we're unaware, he's given each one of us hundreds of gifts. And he wants us to respond to them. So, so, so here's your homework assignment. Perhaps this is the easiest homework assignment we'll ever give. Find at least one thing every single day this week to give thanks for, to receive the splendor of, maybe it's the, the wonder of the human eye and, and just all the colors, all the movement, everything that we can see, the wonders of the human ear, the, 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 the wonders of the universe. Maybe it's the splendor of a frozen grape. I don't know what it is for you. But receive at least one thing every day and specifically, give thanks to God. Pause. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. John started the sermon talking about stubbing your toe, doing people comparisons and looking out the window and seeing the nice car over there. What would happen if we started every single day just thinking, Lord, you've given me good friends. Thank you. You've showered me with so many gifts. Thank you. Help me see your gifts today that I can worship you as the gift giver. We pray together. Can I say one thing for you? Absolutely. Can I just say, I think we'd be, we'd be remiss in saying, we don't want you to miss the best gift of all today. Yeah. For Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Joy begins with the gift God gives us in Jesus. And if you haven't received him, then your eyes aren't going to be open. Mm-hmm. So we invite you today. Would today be, day, be the day that we receive God's first gift and best gift, Jesus Christ? Amen. Lord, we're humbled because you're better than we can imagine. You're so, so good. And so for your patience and your mercy and your kindness, for your faithfulness, for every moment that you are watching over us and caring for us when we don't even see, for being there in the valley of the shadow of death, when the suffering of this world is intense and there you are right at our side, carrying us along in your hand. Thank you. Father, for giving us your son. Jesus, for giving your own life. Thank you. Would you anoint us in your spirit today? Help every single one of us see taste, receive, feel all of the gifts that you're showering upon us that we may worship you and say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen, amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we close.